In June 2017, the nation watched in horror as young Otto Warmbier came home in a coma after 18 months in captivity in North Korea. Warmbier, a 22-year-old student at the University of Virginia, died six days later. The North Koreans had sentenced him to 15 years hard labor for trying to steal a poster from his hotel. We don't blame Otto for this tragedy. We blame first the North Korean communist regime. This tragedy happened while Otto was in their custody. We also blame the American education system. It failed Otto badly. Otto has been called naive in the press. We think it's more accurate to say that he was unaware of the risks of travel to communist countries because the public education system in this country is tilted to the left and minimizes the very real dangers of communist dictatorships. After years of what can only be called left-wing indoctrination, American public school students are predisposed to accept anything the left puts in front of them. The tilt to the left in education, which we will explain throughout this video, has very real consequences for the country and, as we have seen, for students like Otto Warmbier. Otto was a commencement speaker at his public high school in Ohio. He spoke about how he couldn't find inspiration from the great writers in history, so he turned to J.K. Rowling, author of Harry Potter, and then to a TV show for something to tell his graduating class. If the education system had done its job, Otto would certainly have found inspiration in the great writers and would not have had to turn to fantasy and a comedy show for help in writing his speech. At the University of Virginia, Otto majored in finance and minored in global sustainability. The political left influenced both of these choices. Regarding the major in finance, the left has turned education largely into vocational education, workplace preparation. Previous generations of college students were taught the liberal arts, that is, how to live in freedom, not just how to get a job. Today's high school students are more likely to be reading technical manuals than great literature. Imagine trying to find something inspirational to tell your graduating class from a technical manual. Regarding global sustainability, this is the creation of the left and the language of the left. The online course description talks about creating leaders and accomplishing real change. Change, change, change. It also talks about carrying left-wing values into the workplace after graduation. The sustainability course of study is devoted to environmentalism and social equity. Social equity. Remember that phrase. It will come up later in this video. Nearly 200 college presidents have signed commitments to make sustainability a pillar of higher education. Again, we see the not-so-hidden hand of the left creating activists and good soldiers for left-wing causes instead of well-rounded individuals and good citizens. Otto could not help but be influenced by what was on offer from the education system. He was steeped for years in leftist thought. Not only did he minor in sustainability, he volunteered for the UVA's Student Sustainability Committee. The Sustainability Committee celebrates Earth Week, another left-wing creation. The committee also networks with left-wing environmental groups off campus. This lopsided preoccupation with environmentalism in education today crowds out other important considerations, some of which we will be discussing in this video. The education system's approach left young Otto unaware of the dangers of traveling to communist countries. He toured Cuba and Red China before traveling to North Korea. North Korea puts political prisoners in concentration camps, tortures its own people for practicing their faith, and has the death penalty for watching foreign movies. But today's students wouldn't know that because left-wing educators give their left-wing comrades in North Korea a pass. The State Department has long warned Americans not to travel to North Korea due to the serious risk of arrest and detention. All of this is apparently lost on recent generations of students. Polls show nearly half of 16 to 20 year olds are fine with socialism. And one third of millennials believe George W. Bush killed more people than Joseph Stalin. 
The left has succeeded so well in its grand education project that most Americans have no idea that communism has killed 100 million people so far. This is appalling ignorance, despite the astronomical sums spent on public education. Here to help explain these results are a book author and two speakers, survivors of communism, from ACAT Speakers Bureau. First up is Clara Sever. Clara was born in Czechoslovakia. She studied sculpture, then earned an art history degree. She worked restoring Baroque castles, then in radio for the Czech communist government. This ended when the Soviets occupied the country and took over the station. Realizing it was a hopeless situation, the family left Czechoslovakia, settling in the U.S. in 1969. Clara? October 25, 1917. Cruiser Aurora from the port of Fortress Kronstadt shot the famous South heard around the world. That shot started the revolution. Nothing will be the same, ever. The state are we, Lenin pronounced. We are building a dictatorship, an apparatus of violence to suppress the exploiters. So first things first. Deconstruct the old regime in all its concepts. Abolish private property, old educational system, eradicate history. The Soviets rewrite history every 50 years. Officially known. Construct an educational system that will create a new man. All teachers will replace with new cadres, education replaced by indoctrination. Young pioneers took over schools. Teachers were scared into compliance. PC was born. Sounds familiar. Even semantics played an important role. You do not use a phrase, my daughter, my son. That is a proprietary phrase, private property is to be abolished. State are we. We will form the new man. For the other states, which were parts of the Soviet Union, the Russian language started in the third grade. Mandatory state exam for university diploma. Formerly, all nationalities were granted to keep their language and culture. Ask the Kazakhs. They converse in Russian. Their own language completely disappeared. This is something from the embassy itself. I worked with them and this is what I saw and this is what I was taught. So, how do you lose your independency? Libraries implemented a three-tier system. Fundamental books, a prod for the common man. Academic literature, a prod for librarian and books in index. Librorum prohibitorum. No explanation necessary, I think. Those we never saw. The one who owns the media owns the masses. That's common knowledge. There was an old joke that Hitler, after war, losing the war, exclaimed, Have I had the Russian media, nobody would have known that I lost the war. <laughs> October 26, 1932. Stalin at Golki's apartment toasted a gathering of cultural workers. Comrades, you are the engineers of human souls, more effective than tanks. We salute you. From that day on, it became a movement called socialist realism, a style that influenced all spheres of expression, including the language. It brought us real political correctness. There was no getting away from the norms. All instruments of communication, be it radio, newspapers, literature, phones, were strictly censored. 
Anyone could be a detractor, an informer, and many were. It could be your good friend or you. From everything from where you lived, traveled, went to school, or even visiting your family was closely watched. Your life was a life of a dependent. Let's go back a little bit. America 1776. There are two types of revolutions. One that are looking for a real change and the one that just replaces one tyrant with another. People in American colonies came under dire conditions were mostly escaping discrimination of sorts, starting with religious freedom, freedom of movement, meager opportunity to better their lives in a highly class-driven society, and horrendous taxes. Freedom was their leading light, and for that they were willing to sacrifice their possessions, their honor, and their lives. When victorious, they agreed on a common proclamation that will guide them on that unknown territory, the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson advocated education for all, including women. The system at the time was an amalgam of homeschooling, one-room schools where the teacher, with the help of the older pupils, educated them all. Reading, writing, and the basic math was rigorously exercised as well as questioning of how, why, and what if. Tests were run for professional positions where knowledge of the law and history of the country was expected. Although the laws had roots in English, not Roman law, the states created them with consideration of a given situation and discussions and consent of the public or the representatives. The new country was a patchwork of many nationalities who came here to become one. They even had to decide on a common language. There was opportunity for everyone who wanted to work for it. In the harbor, liberty holding high a torch to light the path and a book of laws to keep it safe. Ideas have no borders. As FDR said, a new idea can be as bad as an old idea. It is not sure that he had the communist one in mind. Studying socialist doctrines and facing their results are completely different entities. That's the difference between utopia and reality. Also an interesting construct. Even such a hard man as Lenin, when facing a famine in Soviet Union of 1921-23, had to turn to America for help. Twenty million dollars at that time helped to save Russians from complete disaster. They were ARA volunteers who came to the Soviet Union and arranged the volunteers of the Soviets to come and help and save the uh, country from complete disaster. They also brought some seeds for the new harvest. Finally, the new harvest, because of the seed that was missing from the U utopia planning, the seed came up and brought exactly the same uh, results as there was before the catastrophe. Soviet engineers of human souls to the rescue. Americans did this for their own aggrandizement, not to, sell, not to save the poor souls. That was the thanks that uh, the Americans got for their help. 
it is true that there was an official thanking and Gorky was thanking in his letters to the president, but for the inside consumption, everybody knew that Americans didn't do anything for them at all. American communists visiting Russian Potemkin villages and writing glowing reports about the workers' paradise did the rest. I personally befriended Victor Ruther. Probably some of the people still remember him and his brother, Walter, who was running for the president. Soon of the all the intelligentsia in their ivory towers were singing the same song. Classical education quietly slinked into the dark corner, leaving the field to hordes of social engineers and experimenters. What if Johnny cannot read? He will learn in college. He is smarter than his parents. Why would you listen to them? What? The Soviet Union is no more? We knew it all along. They just messed it up. We'll do it right. Just you wait. The problem is that we are still waiting. Even Kautsky, the big socialist who ended up on the wrong side of Lenin and Stalin, he knew, he said, from democracy to state slavery. American education, by a Columbia professor's admission, says, you come here not to be educated, but indoctrinated. One dogma, one opinion, one leader. You just lost your in. You are a dependent. Thank you, Clara. Next up is Truk Brown. Truk was born in Saigon. Her father was a colonel in the South Vietnamese Army. After the war, he was sent to a re-education camp, not unlike the concentration camps of North Korea today. Truk came to the U.S. in 1967. She holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Indiana University. She often speaks on how revisionist history is being taught in schools in Vietnam today. Among other things, she will tell us how she sees the American left doing much the same thing in our public schools. Truk? Even though the communists promise lots of uh, equality, lots of good things, what they deliver is actually like hell. I would say hell again. And now that they have been in South Vietnam for more than, than 42 years, little by little they, try, they are trying to wipe out our uh, historical background. They try to wipe out all of the real facts and then, and then replace them with all of the, uh, the lies. For example, as an elementary student, I remember I was taught about the two Trung sisters who valiantly fought against the invasion of China more than 2,000 years ago. And um, when they lost after reigning for three years and bringing peace to Vietnam, they lost to the um, the Chinese Ma Vien. So they committed suicide at the uh, Hak Yang River. Yet nowadays, the Viet Cong changed the history book and said the that the two twin sisters uh, became concubines of Ma Vien. So I want to bring to the, the attention of people that um, be aware of communist books. They always change true facts and replace them with all of the lies that would help them 
to dominate the whole world later on. And I'm concerned about the young people here. Of course, I have grandchildren to be worried about because I have noticed that instead of having the separate subjects like history and geography, for example, with history, in the past, I know I read about George Washington, how great he was, and about uh, the Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party, and how valiantly people here fought against the domination of uh, England. I think all of those facts are being are being wiped out now. And um, in school, you will see. Instead of having history and geography as two separate subjects, both of them are being uh, mingled together to become social studies. And so I can see that um, the young people do not have the, the eagerness to fight for the U.S. They seem to have lost their uh, patriotism from what I saw uh, 50 years ago when I came over here. Everything has been um, watered down to uh, like doubt and not believing in um, the good old moral values. And um, it's almost like it's a trend nowadays for the young people to rebel. And I like to see people wake up and teach U.S. kids to respect the greatness of all of our heroes in the past and to turn around and be great again. What I have noticed here is in school, uh, people are so idealistic and they forget that uh, they are being duped by the communists. I feel that um, uh, students here should be taught the dangers of communism. They should be taught reality. For example, uh, that young man, Otto uh, Warmbier, because he wasn't aware of the, um, the communists and their action and their tactics, that's why he went over to North Korea thinking that he could do little pranks just uh, like all of the young kids here do daily and people would not pay attention to uh, what they are doing meaning we would uh, condone those things as part of growing up, part of being young. So what I notice is children in the U.S. are so innocent and they have no idea what goes on outside the U.S., especially in communist countries. So they think that uh, they can go anywhere and express themselves or do little things just like what they're doing in this country. I feel that the children over here are not taught to, uh, to defend themselves and to fight back the brainwashing or the thought control techniques of the communists or I would say the dictators. For example, we should teach high school students and we should tell them about the Tiananmen Square um, in China. We have to repeat that, we have to emphasize that the American students, they have the freedom to express themselves should they demonstrate or do something like that, the government would not come over and then kill them, or worse, have the tanks run over their bodies. 
and we should teach the children in the U.S. about the Chinese government killing the innocent Falun Gong people in China for uh, their organs and sell those organs in the black market and profit the money. We should teach the children over here to appreciate their freedom of expression. We should compare uh, notes and let them know that there's no, there is no religious freedom in Vietnam, for example. Worse, there's oppression of uh, uh, religious practices. And um, what irked me the most is, like Valerie, uh, Jared was um, idolizing Mao Zedong. We should compare how great the past um, U.S. presidents were, like George Washington, for example, their dedication to the country, their self-sacrifice, you know, and what they want is the best for the people, not for themselves. That's the big difference. The communist leaders in Vietnam and in China, they would grab people's wealth, you know, they would um, steal from everybody, and they suppress, suppress the mass population just like in the Dark Ages. I noticed that uh, in the U.S. students are being taught to believe good things about communism. But I want to make them aware of the fact that uh, in the textbook, communism always sounds good. But reality is quite the opposite. And I want the children here to know that communist leaders are always, they are wolf in sheep clothing. And I like the students here to not think of the problems over here as monumental because they are really, really uh, infinitesimal, they're really, really small compared to what happens in communist countries. And to sum up, the young man Otto Warmbier again, being so innocent, he believed that he was free to express himself, and he just took a sign from a house, uh, uh, a uh, hotel lobby. To us, that's nothing. And look at what happened. He was jailed. I'm sure he was badly tortured. He was beaten to death. And when they sent him back to the U.S., he only survived less than two days. And I like the people, the young people here to think about it and really, really think about it and bear in mind that they are living in the greatest country in the world, the U.S. They should maintain that. They should go back to the way of the forefathers. I believe that the U.S. should remain like the beacon of the world for goodness and mercy and equality and justice. Thank you. Thank you, Truk. Next, we will hear from our special guest, Alex Newman. Alex grew up in Latin America, Europe, and Africa. He has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Florida. He is a regular contributor to the New American, Freedom Project, and WND. He is co-author of the book, Crimes of the Educators, How Utopians Are Using Government Schools to Destroy America's Children. Alex comes to us from a remote location.
So John Dewey was pretty much the founding father of the modern government education system that we have today. He really was uh, the architect of the system that today we call the, the public school system. And uh, he was also very open about his views. In fact, he was a committed socialist. You might even call him a communist today. Uh, and he was a humanist. So he had a very different belief system than most Americans at that time. And he realized that this would not be popular among parents and teachers and taxpayers. So he actually wrote in one of his essays that uh, the changes he wanted had to be introduced gradually because if people figured out there would be a violent reaction that would jeopardize the entire success of uh, their little operation. But so uh, his views, again, he didn't really bother to conceal them. Uh, he, uh, he went to the Soviet Union to learn uh, about communism and socialism, he wanted to see what Lenin was up to, and actually thought it was going pretty well. Uh, and in fairness to him, you know, he didn't have the last hundred years of history that we have to look back and say, wow, you know, socialism, communism, everywhere that's been tried, that's resulted in you know, starvation, mass murder, terror, uh, gulags, things like that. So in fairness to him, you know, maybe he just was naive and didn't realize what would happen. But uh, he wasn't shy about expressing his views. In fact, he was one of the... Uh, uh, key people involved in the first Humanist Manifesto. One of the signers helped draft it. And uh, in this Humanist Manifesto, they basically outline uh, their collectivist ideology. In fact, uh, the very first plank is a direct attack, uh, was a direct attack on the core beliefs of the overwhelming majority of Americans. Uh, uh, the, the document said, uh, you know, we believe the universe is eternally self-existing and not created, whereas, uh, you know, Virtually all Americans at that time were devout Christians, and they would know the first words of the Bible read, uh, you know, in the beginning, God created. Uh, and this document goes on and talks about, you know, getting rid of theism and deism. Of course, uh, he did not believe in a creator from which, uh, you know, our rights come from, and so he wanted to reshape the entire thinking. Uh, they wanted to get rid of private property, the nation state, and move toward this kind of global brotherhood of man, so-called. And he even had a model that he, uh, he wanted to see in place in America. It was outlined by Edward Bellamy in a novel he wrote, uh, published in 1888, called Looking Backward, about a communist America in the year 2000. And that really was the vision that animated John Dewey. Uh, so, you know, of course, he realized they couldn't make these drastic changes uh, that suddenly but uh, with Rockefeller money and with some of his cohorts, uh, many of whom were racists, eugenicists, uh, total nut jobs, behavioral psychologists who uh, you know considered children to be kind of advanced circus animals, uh, biological stimulus response mechanisms, uh, and so they wanted to kind of condition the kids to leave their Christian faith, leave the free market, leave their so-called individualism behind, so that they would become part of the the hive, right, the collective. And he really viewed education as being a process of molding and socializing children to fit into this collectivist machine. And so, you know, he really is the origin. You know, they talk about uh, progressive brainwashing in government schools today. That is all because of John Dewey. I mean, he really was the founding father of this uh, enterprise that we call the government education system today. So one of Dewey's uh, biggest contributions to the modern crisis that we have in so-called education was the spread of the so-called whole word method, or the look-say method uh, of teaching reading. Now, uh, you know, to kind of simplify this a little bit, um, we have a phonetic writing system. And in our system of writing, we have different symbols that represent different sounds. So to give you an example, uh, an A uh, might be A as in apple, right? And so the A as a symbol represents the sound A ah, as in apple or, you know, different forms of the, of the vowel A. And uh, this was an incredible advancement in, in human development, really. It was a way to convey any thought, any word, any, anything at all into the written language so it could be recorded for posterity. Uh, previous systems had really been uh, kind of ideographic or, um, you know, maybe the Chinese system is a, is a good example where a symbol actually represents a whole word or a concept. And so this phonetic alphabet was really a great, incredible development. Now, um, the origin of this system actually, you know, it has very benign origins. It was uh, developed by a reverend, Reverend Gorlodet, uh in the uh, early 1800s. And uh, he was overseeing a school for deaf children. And of course, deaf children can't hear sounds. And so if you try to explain to them that there's a correlation between this symbol and a certain sound, that's meaningless to them. Uh, and so he had this idea that, hey, why don't we teach the kids to memorize entire words as if they were a symbol, and that way they'll at least be able to read something. So that was, a, you know, a great thing for deaf children. Um, unfortunately, um, another socialist, uh, another utopian, um, Horace Mann, who had gone to Prussia, and uh, he had seen the statist schools over there indoctrinating the children, he thought that would be a great model to bring to the United States. 
Um, he got this idea that they should try the whole word method in the schools in Boston. Now, it was such an utter disaster in Boston that uh, within a couple of years, all the headmasters of the schools got together and wrote a scathing essay explaining how absurd this was. And so it was pretty much abandoned for you know, 50, 60 years until John Dewey came along and resurrected this system. And ultimately, you know, by the end of World War II, he really had this system spread throughout government schools all across this country. Uh, he worked uh, at the University of Chicago and at the Teachers College at the, at the Columbia University to develop different reading programs that would make use of this whole word method. Now, the biggest problem with the whole word method is that it doesn't work. Um, you know, some children will be able to memorize a lot of words, but that's not how you read our, our language, right? Our, our written language. And so what happens is the kids develop these bad reflexes and they end up dyslexic, they end up hating reading, they end up you know, functionally illiterate, many of them. And um, this has been known, again, since the 1840s when the schoolmasters in Boston exposed this quackery for what it was. And yet John Dewey resurrected it. It was again exposed in the 1950s by Rudolf Flesch with Why Johnny Can't Read. And then it was exposed yet again by Dr. Sam Blumenfeld, with who I, I wrote a, the book Crimes of the Educators, in his book The New Illiterates. He actually broke down uh, each of these reading programs and explained why they were so harmful. So uh, this quackery has again been exposed for more than 150 years. And yet if you look at the Common Core, still to this day in every government school essentially across America, they're ordering kindergarten teachers to have the kids memorizing words. And granted, they've added in a little bit of phonics at this point because parents were outraged and enough people know about this. But, uh, you know, they still have the kids developing these faulty reflexes that will have lifelong implications and will produce lifelong harm in their ability to read. And so the implications from this uh, obviously are, are extreme, right? If you look in some jurisdictions like Washington, D.C., uh, you have, according to the State Education Agency report released last year, you have more than two-thirds of the adult population cannot read. They're functionally illiterate. Uh, so, you know, think about what this means. These people cannot access books. They cannot go to the library and seek out information for themselves. They can't read the Bible, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the great works of literature, you know, the classics. They can't even open, uh, you know, read basic instructions on how to assemble something. So we have a really big problem in this country. This has contributed, I think, in an enormous way to the dumbing down of the American population. And it's, it's all by design. That's the most tragic thing about it is that this has been known, again, forever, and yet they continue to do this harm in the schools. So what we need to do, of course, is go back to teaching phonics, and that would allow children to read anything you put in front of them. Uh, but you know, there's a reason why they don't do that, and I think people need to be outraged about that. So Charlotte Iserbid is uh, one of the people we dedicated our book to, and I think she's one of America's unsung heroes. Uh, she really is an amazing woman, personal friend of mine, a woman who I respect uh, very, very much. And uh, one of her biggest contributions to this whole discussion is uh, during her time as a senior advisor at the U.S. Department of Education under uh, President Ronald Reagan. Uh, so she went to work uh, in the unconstitutional education bureaucracy, and she stumbled upon all these different documents that outlined a plan to dumb down the kids, to uh, kind of merge the U.S. And, and Soviet systems of education with a goal toward eventually moving us toward this kind of hybrid global system that uh, the establishment, the elites, if you will, had wanted to create. And you know, this plan goes back all the way to the 1930s, uh, according to some of the documents Iserbit found. So she was really shocked and alarmed by this. So she started grabbing these documents and leaking them to the press. And, uh, finally, she ended up swiping as many as she could get, and she published a lot of them in, uh, in her book, The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America. And what these documents show is a deliberate plan, right? A lot of people assume that the crisis in education that we have is some kind of accident, that maybe we forgot how to teach children, how to learn the basics, and how to read and write and all the rest of it. Uh, but what Isabit's documents showed was that, no, this was actually a deliberate plan uh, conceived with the purpose of dumbing down the population for the purpose of creating this t type of global system that would uh, basically involve America surrendering its freedoms. Uh, I really encourage people to take a look at uh, some of Iserbit's revelations. She has found uh, incredibly important information. She put a lot at risk to uncover this and to make it known to the American people. And I, I think it's crucial to understand this if we want to understand what went wrong with the education system, why so many of our young people are graduating from the schools saying that uh, you know, they support socialism. Uh, you know, it really is a crisis, and it really was a deliberate plan, and uh, Charlotte Iserbid has the documents to prove it. 
Uh, just recently, I had the opportunity to go up to Washington, D.C. for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. They had a, a teacher training program, and so one of the many hats I wear is a, a teacher. I teach, uh, I think, some of the brightest high school students in America through the Freedom Project Academy, and uh, I had the opportunity to go up there and, uh, and take this course uh, from the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. Now, um, you know, there was a few things I probably would have added into the program to uh, kind of give students, you know, more well-rounded view of things. You know, I, I think it's crucial to understand, for example, the U.S. government's role in uh, putting Fidel Castro in power. That's just one example. Uh, U.S. Ambassador Earl Smith outlined this whole process. He testified before Congress. He wrote a book about it, The Fourth Floor, where he said Castro would not have been in power were it not for the deliberate policy of the United States to remove Batista and put him in power. Uh, you can make a similar argument for what happened in China uh, with, the, uh, with the empowering of Chairman Mao and the betrayal against uh, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalist leader of China. But uh, you know, those concerns aside, it really was an incredibly valuable program. Uh, the goal is to give teachers the tools and the resources and the knowledge to teach their students about the evils of communism. You know, a hundred million people uh, were murdered by their own governments, by their own communist and socialist governments over the last hundred years. That's a huge amount of people. And yet today you have all these kids graduating from high school calling themselves socialists, voting for people like Bernie Sanders who say they're going to implement socialism. How could it be that these kids don't know anything about this so-called ideology that has resulted in so much suffering, so much death, so much terror and mass murder, uh, that they're running around talking about themselves as socialists? So we clearly have a really big problem here. And I think the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation has uh, one possible solution, and that is training teachers so that they can teach their kids the true history of what has happened under communist regimes, this pseudo-ideology, uh, the failures of central planning, and kids really do need to know this. So, uh, you know, there was a little bit more I would have added in, you know, to be fair, they only had a couple of days with us, so you, you can't cram everything in there, but it's so important that our young people learn these things, and uh, the fact that they don't learn these things leads to incredible blunders, like this ill-fated uh, trip to North Korea, right? Uh, you know, these kids don't know any better, they don't realize that we're dealing with just absolute wickedness here because they were never taught. Their teachers kept them in the dark about this. So, uh, you know, that's one program among many, but we really do need to get the word out to teachers so that they can pass on that knowledge to their students. We have leveled the charge that American education has been taken over by the left. Don't take our word for it. A young elementary school teacher called into a radio talk show recently he said liberals are in complete control of education where he is. He sees young people buying into liberal philosophy because it's what they've been taught. A lot of his kids think they are victims, that somehow America has been unfair to them. So the schools are not only failing to educate, they are deliberately trying to tear America down. It's called critical thinking, about which I'll have more to say later. At the university level, Clara mentioned a Columbia, Columbia University professor who admitted, you come here not to be educated, but indoctrinated. There is another admission, more explicit, in the documentary Agenda 2, Masters of Deceit. In that documentary, a community college professor tells the filmmaker, congratulations on identifying us. I am a communist. We will win because we are taking your children. The methods the left is using to take your children are insidious and despicable. Alex Newman mentioned the whole sight reading method. Ask yourself why the education system deliberately uses a method guaranteed to produce bad results. Schools that teach phonics instead of whole sight do better on standardized test scores. Educators have known that for decades. So why do they persist in using whole sight to teach reading? That's not the only strange thing about American education worth asking about. Common Core math reduces kids to counting dots instead of solving math problems in their head. It takes a lot longer that way and it limits progress later on. What sense does that make? Schools are using something called social and emotional learning, SEL, to, mani to manipulate children's values, attitudes, and beliefs regardless of what they are taught at home. 
The schools are psychologically profiling kids and steering their behavior. Why are schools trying to get into your kids' heads? Is forcing children to conform to government-approved attitudes and beliefs really what education should be about? Schools are teaching gender spectrum and gender fluidity and doing it at a very early age, even kindergarten. There have always been transgender people and nobody should hate them. But why is the government setting about to deliberately create more of them? Doesn't this sound like Stalinist Russia where the government deliberately set about to create the new Soviet man with all the attributes of good little communists? And talk about tearing down things. Wow! If you can confuse kids about whether they're a boy or a girl, you can confuse them about anything. Finally, why have test scores remained flat while spending on education keeps going up and up? Who's benefiting? Not the students. Follow the money. Ka-ching, ka-ching. I'm amazed how many connections there are between communism and the American education system today. The pattern is very clear. I'm going to lay out some of these connections for you now, but for documentation in detail, see the book Credentials to Destroy, How and Why Education Became a Weapon by Robin Eubanks. It started with education theorist John Dewey. Alex Newman spoke at length about Dewey, but what I want to emphasize here is how a, bi a, a biographer summed up what Dewey was really about, what he was really doing. He was supplying the intellectual weapons for a non-totalitarian Marxism. Vladimir Lenin liked Dewey's ideas about producing a Marxist society so much that he had Dewey's books translated into Russian in 1918 so Dewey's ideas could be implemented in the Soviet Union for the express purpose of helping the communists gain control over the Russian people. The Soviets returned the favor with the influential Turchenko Report in 1976. It was intended to help spread the Soviet education system to socialist countries around the world. It talked about how education can be a weapon in the ideological enslavement of the masses. It spelled out how to target the entire personality, teach norms, and produce desired behaviors. There is a direct line between the Turchenko Report and Social and Emotional Learning, SEL, in American schools today. The report also talked about using computers in school for psychological control and direction of the learning process. Don't let that go by too fast. Turchenko wanted computers used in schools so teachers would be freed up to focus on psychological control of their students. Computer-based instruction is a big part of what goes on in American schools today. As documented by Robin Eubanks, Turchenko's ideas found their way into the outcomes-based education program of the 1980s and are reflected in Common Core in public schools today. The bottom line is that Soviet techniques of psychological manipulation are in use in government schools in America right now. Another connection between communism and American education is something called critical thinking. Despite what it sounds like, it's not about rational analysis or using your brain to figure things out. It's about studying social inequities, as Otto Warmbier did in his Global Sustainability course at UVA, and learning the supposed importance of political, social, and economic change. Change, change, change. Critical thinking der derives from critical theory, which was started by the Frankfurt School. These were Marxists who fled Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Critical theory means questioning and attacking every aspect of civilization. Tear it all down and replace it with socialism. Critical thinking is part of Common Core and is taught in American public schools today, and you have cultural Marxists to thank for it. The last connection between communism and American education I will highlight is the fact that a lot of classroom activities now take place in groups. Education has always included some group activity, but the exaggerated emphasis on group work in schools at all levels today propagates a number of communist values in one neat little package. Students are being taught how to live in a collectivized society where individuals don't matter as much as the group does. 
education theorist John Goodlad talked about how the group takes precedence over individual values and desires. Collectivism is just the first value being spread through group work. Everybody in the group gets the same grade, so they are being taught that individuals and individual achievement don't matter. Equality of outcomes is what matters. We wouldn't want to discriminate because some people are smarter than others, would we? Under this system, smart kids are punished and their smarts are expropriated by the group. Gold brickers are rewarded. They get the same grade. One group activity is form a nonprofit and figure out, figure out how to get government grant money for it. You can't get more left wing than that. Heaven forbid that it be an exercise about forming a business to bring a new product to market. That wouldn't be useful at all in the new socialist society American educators are trying to bring about. Equality of outcomes, group consciousness, attitudinal engineering, forget individual achievement, forget independent thought, forget the self and focus on the human family. Transform education so students learn how to live and work collectively. Redistribute wealth. Obsess about the environment. These are communist values or tactics. American education theorists have been writing openly about them ever since Dewey. They want schools to transmit these values, not teach knowledge. To what end? Education theorist Theodore Brameld openly worshipped communi communist Russia, China, and Cuba. He wrote, Revolution may be achieved, says Marx, through legal and educational processes, a hope of the American socialists. If you thought public schools were about teaching knowledge, they're not. They're about molding kids into taking their place in a brave new socialist society. Forget the three R's. There's only one R that matters now, revolution. Individual teachers may not know what the game is, but administrators who studied all of this in grad school and the people who design what goes on in the classroom, like Common Core, certainly do. We've had two survivors of communism tell us in this video that American education sounds a lot like what the left, that is the communists, did in the countries they fled. Obliterate history, limit reading and math skills, teach social justice. If that isn't what you want for your own children, don't leave their education entirely in the hands of government schools. Take your kids to the library and get them reading books outside their schoolwork. Consider homeschooling or private schools and enrichment programs that fill in the gaps we've discussed in this video. Consider middle and high schools that teach traditional curriculums. Consider colleges that teach the great books. You are paying for your children's education. Why don't you get them one instead of paying for left-wing indoctrination? Because as the Otto Warmbier story teaches us, indoctrination kills. Mm -hmm.